Hello and welcome. In this lesson, we'll explore graphs of rational functions in the form f of x equals ax plus b over cx plus d. So let's get started with our first example. When graphing rational functions, a good starting point would be finding the restrictions. The restrictions are the values of x that can make the denominator 0, thus the function undefined. In our case, the denominator is x minus 2 which means that x minus 2 must be different than 0, which tells us that x has to be different than 2. And from here, we can easily state the domain where we can say that x can be any real number except for 2. So we'll write x belongs to the set of real numbers such that x is different than 2. The next thing that we will find is the vertical asymptote. And it's best to find the vertical asymptote right after you state the domain because vertical asymptotes are tied in with the domain. As a matter of fact, vertical asymptotes have their equations in the form x equals the restricted values of it. In our case, we have only one restriction, which means we have only one vertical asymptote at x equals 2. Now, asymptotes are very important in guiding how to graph the ras a rational function. So we'll continue with the horizontal asymptotes. Now, remember this. While vertical asymptotes are easily found by referring to the domain of the function, horizontal asymptotes are found by studying the end behaviors of a function. The end behaviors of a function means that we are looking at what happens to the y values as x approaches infinity and what happens to the y values as x approaches negative infinity. Now, the reason why we want to do this is because basically horizontal asymptotes are horizontal lines and the graph of a function is not allowed to touch the horizontal lines those horizontal lines that we call asymptotes, which means that no matter how big x becomes, positively or negatively big, the values of the y in the function won't exceed or won't become that particular value that the asymptote has. So in order to discuss the end behavior of a function, we will need to send x to infinity. Now, there is a certain process that we need to follow, which we mentioned in the mini lesson on the asymptotes in the previous lesson. And this is how it will be done in this particular function. So we have the function y equals 2x plus 3 over x minus 2. And obviously, if you want to know what the values of y are as it, x approaches a specific number, then we can substitute it in. However, in this case, if you substitute x by infinity right away, then we'll end up with infinity over infinity, which is an undefined number. So in order to fix this problem, we factor out x, which is the term that brings infinity in both numerator and denominator. If you factor x out of the numerator, then we'll have 2 plus 3 over x. So try it this way, if you expand back, x times 2 is 2x, and x times 3 over x equals 3. Next in the denominator, we have x, 1 minus 2, divided by x. Simplify, and now we can substitute x by infinity, 2 plus 3 over infinity, divided by 1 minus 2 over infinity. Let me focus the camera here. And knowing that dividing by a number by infinity will give us almost 0 or 0 plus, which means a number slightly bigger than 0, then we're going to say that the numerator becomes 2 plus 0 plus over 1 minus, the same idea applies to 2 over infinity, 0 plus. Now imagine adding a number 
0 plus to 2. It's going to look like this, 2 point, and I'm going to add in here three zeros. You can add as many as you want and the one, so four decimal places. Over 1 minus 0 plus, so this will be still a positive number, very close to 1, but a little less than 1, which will make the denominator 0 0.999. If you use a calculator to perform this division, then the calculator will tell you that the answer would be 2 and some more, which in our case, we're going to say is 2 plus. Now, there are two important things that we get from this end behavior. Number one, y equals 2 will be the horizontal asymptote of the function. So, we'll say that the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 2. And the next important fact that we need to get from here is coming from the plus sign at top, on top of the number 2. So this indicates that as x approaches infinity, the values of y oops, will approach 2 from above. Or, in other words, 2 plus. What does that mean again? It means that if the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 2, then the graph will follow the asymptote above it. So it will go this way around. Now, moving on to the next end behavior is when x approaches negative infinity. We're going to use the exact same strategy. So we'll factor x and We'll substitute x this time by negative infinity. So we have 2 plus 3 over negative infinity over 1 minus 2 divided by negative infinity. So I followed along with this step in here because this part is the same for the next end behavior. So that will give us y equals 2 plus Remember that when we divide a number by negative infinity, then we get 0 minus. So 2 plus 0 minus divided by 1 minus. So we're talking about this minus in here. We're dividing by negative infinity, which means that we are subtracting 0 minus. So we'll say minus, oopsie. zero minus okay now <clears throat> try to imagine what number two plus zero minus will look like so we are adding negative zero point zero 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 one so that means that we'll have one point nine 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 you can add as many nines as you wish and subtracting a negative zero in the denominator means that we're adding a zero plus so it's 1 minus negative 0 0.0001, which will make the denominator 1.0001, so slightly bigger than 1. So in this case, we're going to say that if you use the calculator, you get about 2, but a little bit less than 2. So your answer would be probably 1.99999. So again... This confirms the case of the horizontal asymptote being at y equals 2. But it also tells us the end behavior of the function as the x values approach negative infinity. And we'll say that now we know that as x approaches negative infinity, the values of y will approach number 2 from below. Or in other words, y will approach 2 minus. So again, remember that vertical asymptotes are tied in with the domain and restrictions, and horizontal asymptotes are tied in with the end behavior of the function. The next very important thing we have to do here is the x and the y intercepts. Remember the x intercepts are found by making y equal to 0. And that means that given that function is 
2x plus 3 over x minus 2. It means that y will be 0. So substitute y by 0. And that's how you obtain a rational equation, a simple rational equation, which will always solve in a similar way by cross multiplication. So we'll cross multiply. And then we'll have 2x plus 3 equals 0 times x minus 2, which is 0. And that tells us that the x-intercept will be at negative 3 over 2. In a similar way, we find the y-intercept. At the y-intercept, x equals 0. This is my favorite intercept to find because it's easier. You simply substitute x by 0 and evaluate the function at 0. And you will notice a pattern as well. And always look for patterns when you are solving problems because they give you shortcuts and also add understanding and meaning to the whole process of um, solving a problem. So that means that we have 0 plus 3 over 0 minus 2, obviously. And notice how the y-intercept will always be here, the ratio of the constant terms, from numerator and denominator. So we'll say that the y-intercept equals negative 3 over 2. So it just happened this time to, uh, to obtain the same values for both x and the y-intercept. But there's still two different points. So the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to highlight all the information that I've collected. So I have the x and the y-intercept. I have the end behaviors of the function. And I now know what the vertical and horizontal asymptotes are. And as of now, that's all we need to get started with the process of graphing the rational function. Now I'm going to set the axis. And when I set the axis, I consult with asymptotes. The fact that the vertical asymptote is at x equals 2 tells me that I'm going to need more positive x values. So instead of drawing the vertical axis right in the middle, I'm going to draw the vertical axis slightly to the left of the middle. So here we go. Vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is at y equals 2, which means that I'm going to need more positive values of y. And that means that instead of drawing the horizontal axis right in the middle, I'm going to draw it slightly lower than the middle so that I can access more positive y values. And just to be courteous, don't forget to label the axis because they have a name. So the x and the y axis. And now we'll start with the scale. I'll let one square represent one unit. So we'll have 2, 4, 6, 8, and then continue on. I left this uh, scaling process um, to complete in here. I know it's time consuming, but it is very important that we set a good scale and we kind of review this together because a good scale and a good graph, I mean a good uh, Cartesian plane, helps us draw the graph with accuracy. And there is some thinking involved in it. So I'm going to start with vertical asymptote, which is right at x equals 2. And I will label the asymptote by its equation. And then the horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. And again, I'll label the horizontal asymptote by its equation. I will plot the x and the y intercepts. So the x-intercept is at negative 3 over 2, or negative 1.5, and y-intercept is at negative 3 over 2 again, or negative 1.5. And now we have to figure out where the graph is. Now, one very important fact to remember is that the graphs of rational functions are curves that follow their asymptotes. That means that once you draw the asymptotes, you will see that the graph 
is divided or the Cartesian plane is divided sort of in four, I call them four rooms, okay? And it's not a mathematical, you know, term. <laughs> and there will be graphs in selected rooms. And when I see that, there are two intercepts in this particular room, or two points in this particular room, it means that the graph will actually be in this one here. And the graph will be a curve that follows the asymptote. So the only way to draw the graph in here, where the two points are connected, right, and the graph follows the asymptotes, both vertical and horizontal, will be drawing a curve that goes in this direction. Now, there is another thing that I need to be careful of and then um, make sure that is reflected on the graph that I'm drawing, the end behavior. Now, when, X appro when we are in this quadrant here, on this room, the x values are approaching negative infinity. So we have to consult with the end behavior of the function as x approaches negative infinity. And it tells us that the y values will be below the asymptote, so 2 minus. And if I drew the function here, or the graph in here, that means that the values of the y in this curve would be below 2. So I'm more confident now that this will be the shape of the graph for this portion of it. Now, we have to find out what is happening to the other side of the vertical asymptote because so far we know what the y values will be for the x values that are to the left of the vertical asymptote. But how about the right side of it? For the right side of it, we follow a very simple technique and that is selecting certain points on the graph and finding what the values of y are at those points. So in this case, I would select the values of y at x equals 4 and x equals 6 and see what the shape of the graph would look like. So at x equals 4, and I'm going to show the calculation somewhere in here, and I'm going to call them the special points. And you can use special points to figure out the location of each piece of the graph in a rational function. So if x equals 4, the value of y would be 2 times 4, 8 plus 3 over 4 minus 2, which is 11 over 2 or 5.5. I will plot this point on the graph. So at x equals 4, the value of the function will be 5.5. And, and then at x equals 6, the value of the function would be, remember, we're substituting x by 6. 2 times 6, 12, plus 3, divided by 6 minus 2, which will be 15 over 3, uh, over 4, sorry. <laughs> and 15 over 4 would be uh, more than 3. So we can use a calculator to find that. Three point seventy-five. It is important to find the decimal value of it because it's easier to locate a decimal number on the Cartesian plane than a fraction, most of the time at least. So here is the next point. So at x equals 6, the y value is 3.75. And this would be enough for us to know how to draw or how to shape the graph. Remember that we are sketching and not graphing with high accuracy here because the whole purpose of analyzing the graphs of functions is to be able to understand the behavior of a function and voila this is the graph of 2x plus 3 over x minus 2. we'll move on to the next example obviously you can try this on your own if you wish that's better I'm going to continue with the solution again. So y equals x minus 3 over 2x plus 1, restrictions, 
follow the denominator for it, 2x plus 1, different than 0, x different than negative half. That means domain is any real number such that x is different than negative half. Which means again that vertical asymptote is at x equals negative 1 over 2. Let's start with the end behaviors, which means we are making x approach infinity and negative infinity and analyze what happens to the values of y. I'm going to write the equation of the function first, y equals x minus 3 divided by 2x plus 1. It's the same process we follow, factor out x, and then we have 1 minus 3 divided by x over factor out x from the denominator, 1 plus 1 over x. I'm going to add a small little detail here, as I explain. From my experience, my students find it confusing at first how we factor out x from a term that doesn't actually contain x. And this is a nice way of actually explaining it, or I find that that, that, that has been successful so far. Imagine that you are trying to factor something in the form 2a plus 6. So the common factor here, obviously, it's obvious because it's a coefficient, numerical coefficient, 2. So it's quite intuitive for everyone to factor such a binomial. So you're going to say that if you factor out 2 from 2a, then we have a. We have no problem with this term. And if we factor 2 from 6, then we have 3. And it takes almost no time for anyone to do this, right? But then these are numbers, and numbers are easier to see, understand, and deal with. Now, when it comes to having a number and factoring a variable from it, we follow the exact same process. But let's look into it a little bit more closely. Think about how you obtain this number 3 when you factor 2. So number 3 comes from dividing 6 by 2. And that's how we get number 3. Now, in the same way, if we have a binomial in the form x minus 3, and we want to factor x, then we'll say that if you take x out of 1x, then we're left with 1. And the term negative 3 now will become negative 3 divided by the factor that you just took out. And the factor you took out was x. So just like you divide 6 by 2 in order to obtain number 3, we divide number 3 by x in order to obtain what's left from the term 3 once you factor out x. And once you see and understand this, it becomes as intuitive as factoring a numerical coefficient, a common factor in number form. So we'll simplify x. And we're ready now to substitute x by either infinity or negative infinity. So we'll say this would be y equals 1 minus 3 over x divided by 1 plus 1 over x. Sorry, that's a 2 here. I missed it. Beautiful. <laughs> so let's substitute x by infinity. So we're following this end behavior now. And here will be the negative infinity. Then y values will be 1 minus 3 over infinity divided by 2 plus 1 over infinity. And here we'll have y equals 1 minus 3 over negative infinity divided by 2 plus 1 over negative infinity. So let's see what happens. Remember that 3 over infinity is a number divided by infinity, that's 0. Both are positive, so 0 plus. 1 over infinity is a number divided by infinity, which is 0, 0 plus. So we have y equals 1 minus 0 plus divided by 2 plus 0 plus. 
So in other words, we have a number slightly less than one. So think about it, subtracting a 0, 0.000 something. So we'll have something like this here, right? And I'm bringing this as an example just to visualize the size of the number because at this point in time when we've just learned this, right, the concept of zero plus zero minus division by infinity, it's a little bit awkward at first, okay? So we need a little bit of repetition to uh, become more comfortable around it. Two plus zero plus will be a number slightly bigger than two, okay? And if you use the calculator to perform this division, then you will find that the answer will be 0 0.5, a little bit less than 0 0.5, probably 0 0.45. And I'm going to show this on the calculator in here, just for the fun of it. So we'll have, oops, what was that? <laughs> I just wanted a calculator. I think this is an advertisement. Perfect. So... We had 0 0.1999, I'm going to keep the same number of decimal places, divided by 2.0001. And notice how we get here 0 0.499999, right? So which is a number very close to 0 0.5, but less than 0 0.5. So you can write it as 0 0.5 minus, or you can write it as 1 over 2 minus. In a similar way, we are finding the values of y as x approaches negative infinity. 3 divided by negative infinity will give 0 minus. 1 divided by negative infinity is 0 minus. Again, we have explained this in the previous lesson. Refer to it if you need a refresher. So that means we have 1 minus 0 minus over 2 plus 0 minus. In other words, we have 1 minus 0 point, negative 0 0.001, which will be slightly bigger than 1, divided by 2 plus negative 0 0.0001, which will make this number 1.999. So, if you use the calculator, actually, to substitute these particular numbers, I mean, to perform the division, I'm going to bring this down here, actually, to be consistent, then you will find that, sorry, so you will find that uh, this would be equal to 1.5. And let's try it again together. So 1 plus, or 1.0001, Okay, again, understand that where this extra is coming from, you are subtracting a negative number. Because remember that zero minus is a negative number, right? And 1.001 divided by 1.9999 will give us 0 0.5 and some more which means that the answer will be 0 0.5 plus, which in fraction form can be written as 1 over 2 plus. So right now we know that as x approaches infinity, the y values are approaching 1 over 2 from below, and as x approaches negative infinity, that would be 1 over 2 from above. Now. Just like in the previous example, we are going to get two things in here. So number one is the end behaviors, right? And then the horizontal asymptote. Notice that the y values will approach 1 over 2, never become 1 over 2, which makes y equals 1 over 2 the horizontal asymptote. Remember to always write the horizontal asymptote, like in an equation form, y equals a number, okay? Very often I see people write just the number, which tells me that they have the idea, but um, communicating the answer the correct way is very important as well. So, last but not least, the intercepts, or the points. Let's call them the points. So the important points will be the x and the y intercepts first, which are found always in the same way in any function, for x-intercept, we'll make y equal to 0. Then for y-intercept, x equals 0. Here we go. 
0 equals x minus 3 over 2x plus 1. And by now you have noticed that in order to find the x-intercept, we're basically making the numerator 0, right? Because after cross-multiplication, this becomes non-existent. Or we can think this way. If the, fra uh, the ratio of two numbers is 0, that means the numerator must have been 0. So I'll write here x minus 3 equals 0, which tells us that the x-intercept is at positive 3. And there goes my favorite intercept again. <laughs> so we have x equals 0 minus 3 over 2 times 0 plus 1. So substitute x by 0 in the equation of the function. And the y-intercept would be equal to negative 3 over 1 or negative 3. So in other words, the ratio of the constant terms. So I guess we're ready to start graphing. So I'll highlight the information. We have x and y-intercepts. We have the asymptotes. And we also have the end behaviors. going to start with setting the axis. For this, we consult with the asymptotes, which are at 1 half and negative half. And we're going to give enough room to the y values. I think that drawing the axis in the center won't make much of a difference. So <clears throat> we're going to go the traditional way then. There we go. And here we are. Label the axis. And now scale them. We have the x-intercepts at 3 and negative 3. I mean the x-intercept at 3 and the y-intercept at negative 3. So I will plot them. And we have the asymptotes at x equals negative half and y equals positive half. So if I set 1 square equal to 1 unit, Then the vertical asymptote will go right in the middle here. So this is negative half. All right, so 1, negative 1. This would be negative 3. And the vertical asymptote will go right in the middle of the first unit in the negatives. And horizontal asymptote is at one half, which will means uh, what, uh, which means that it's going to go right in the middle here. I will label the asymptotes by their equations. So vertical asymptote is x equals negative half, and horizontal asymptote is at, is at y equals positive half. Now, notice how here we have the intercepts as well. So we have an x-intercept at negative three. The, uh, at positive 3 and the y-intercept at negative 3. And that tells me again that since the rational functions are graphs that follow or curves that follow their asymptotes, in this case it has to pass through these two points. So these two points must be connected and I will connect them. Then the graph will have to follow the asymptotes. So let's check and see the end behavior of the function as x approaches infinity. So as x approaches infinity, the values of y will approach 1 over 2 from below. So it's going this way. So it seems that we are on the right track, so we can draw this side or this curve with more confidence. Now, we're going to need to draw the other piece of the graph, which means that so far we know what the graph is going to be or is going to look like for this domain, part of the domain. So from negative half towards positive infinity. Now we don't know what the graph is going to look like for these x values, so we have to check and see what's gonna happen when the x values go into the negatives. So again, we're gonna choose some special points. And remember that for points we Choose the x and the y intercepts, right? And the specials. So the specials will help us graph the function 
for the rest of the domain where we don't see or we don't have intercepts. In this case, I'm going to choose x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 4. Why not? So I want one point close enough to the vertical asymptote and a little bit further. Why not? So if x equals negative 2, the value of y, just a simple quick calculation, substitute x by negative 2, we have negative 2 minus 3, negative 5. And then denominator 2 times negative 2, negative 4, plus 1, negative 3. So that's 5 over 3, almost positive 2. And when x equals negative 4, we have negative 4 minus 3, negative 7. divided by 2 times negative 4, which is negative 8 plus 1. Oh, well, that's negative 7. That's a nice number, 1. So we'll say that when x equals negative 2, the value of the function is 5 over 3. So at negative 2, which is right here, the function will be 5 over 3 or slightly less than 2 here. And at negative 4, the value of the function will be exactly 1. So here are two points, and I think this would be enough. If you want to give value of negative 1 to x, that can help you draw the function with more accuracy. I am happy with these two points, and voila, this is the graph of this function. Now, I want to bring your attention to something very, very important here. Now horizontal asymptotes. So notice that in the function y equals x minus 3 over 2x plus 1, and I'm going to write some notes in here. So y equals x minus 3 over 2x minus 1. The horizontal asymptote was at y equals 1 half. In the function y equals 2x plus 3 over x minus 2, Uh, was it minus or plus? Minus 2. The horizontal asymptote was at y equals 2. And I'm inviting all of you now to um, observe a pattern in here. So the, y, uh, the horizontal asymptote was at y equals 1 over 2. Now where do you see a ratio of 1 over 2 in this function, the first one? Notice that the coefficient of x is 1. In the numerator, coefficient of x in the denominator is 2. For the second function, the coefficient of x in the numerator is 2, and coefficient of x here is 1. So the horizontal asymptotes in functions of the form linear over linear perfectly match the ratio of the leading coefficients. And this will be the case in the rest of functions of the form ax plus b over cx plus d and some more which we will talk about in the next lessons. If you want to try one more example, let's take y equals 5x minus 2 over 3x minus 4. Remember how we find the horizontal asymptotes. So I'm going to call this the horizontal asymptote notes. Horizontal asymptotes are found by taking out x, and making sure that this term t turns into a constant. Now the rest of the terms will become zero. So, and that is because x is becoming infinity. So goodbye x, and then we have 5 over 3, and we'll have in here 0 plus 0 minus this, depending on wherever x is going, right? Because we're dividing by a very large, either positive or negative number, right? And what's left is always the ratio of the leading coefficients. And we'll say that the horizontal asymptote in this case, again, will be y equals 5 over 3. So from now on, when determining the horizontal asymptotes of a rational function in the form linear over linear, we simply have to um, identify the leading coefficients and 
state the asymptote at the as the y equals the ratio of the leading coefficients. Now I will extend this idea a little bit further. And that is something that we are going to uh, do in the next lesson, but since we're here, it's easier to make that connection. Now, very soon, we're going to learn functions in the form quadratic over quadratic or cubic over cubic. When we define the horizontal asymptotes, we'll still follow the same process. For example, we have 2x squared plus 5, I'll keep things simple this time, over 3x squared minus 2. Again, in order to identify the horizontal asymptote, we're going to factor x squared, which will change the function to become x squared to plus 5 over x squared, and then x squared 3 minus 2 over x squared. So the x squares will simplify, and we're going to end up here with y equals 2 plus 5 over, remember that x is approaching infinity, or negative infinity, and 3 minus 2 over infinity. So these numbers become 0, and the values of y will approach 2 over 3. Obviously not exactly 2 over 3, but we'll get close to it. And notice again that the horizontal asymptote will be the ratio of the leading coefficient. This is a very nice shortcut that can help us find the horizontal asymptotes in no time. But again, it is very important we understand where the shortcuts come from, and I hope that these examples kind of clarified that. Now try to imagine that if this power increased to become a power of 3, the same idea will actually repeat itself. What's important, though, is that we need to have the same degree in both numerator and denominator for this to happen, which means that we have um, to apply this idea only in cases where rational functions are given as linear over linear or quadratic over quadratic. And you can go further, cubic over cubic, quartic over quartic, and so on and so forth. I hope you're ready for the next example. The next example looks quite the same as the previous one, but it's slightly different. So let's get started with a normal process of graphing, which means restrictions first. 3x minus 3 must be different than 0, which means that x must be different than 1. That means that the domain must be any real number x, such as x different than 1. And from here, we're going to say, oh, so the vertical asymptote then must be at x equals 1. How about the horizontal asymptote? So after the explanation about how we find the horizontal asymptotes, we will inspect this function and we'll think, okay, so we have a linear over linear. The leading coefficient in the numerator here is 3, denominator 1. And this tells us that horizontal asymptote must be at y equals 3, the ratio of the leading coefficients, right? So, so far, happy with my findings. I'm going to start with the x and the y intercept. x intercept make y equal to 0, which means 0 must be 3x minus 3 over x minus 1. By now, we hopefully have figured out the connection between, um, or the shortcut to finding the x-intercepts. Basically, we make the numerator 0, but you can always use cross-multiplication. So the idea is 3x minus 3 equals 0, which means that the x-intercept must be at 1. And for the y-intercept, we're going to make x equal to 0 which means that y-intercept must be at 0 minus 3 over 0 minus 1. So the y-intercept is at positive 3. So you probably already noticed that something unusual is happening here. The x-intercept is at 1. But wait a second. Isn't the vertical asymptote at x equals 1 and isn't the restriction at x equals 1? then the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 3. And again, we're thinking, oh, okay, but isn't the horizontal asymptote at y equals 3, which means the function will never 
b equal to 3? So in a situation like this, we're going to try to look at this function a little bit differently and think, what did just happen here? Two things that we can check with. Number one, look into the equation of this function. So 3x minus 3 over x minus 1. So we're going to take a look at this equation. But first, I'm very curious to see what the graph of this function will look like. So let's check it out. So use Desmos and we'll type up the function y equals open brackets 3x minus 3 close brackets divide by and now we are down in the denominator x minus 1. Okay, so let's take a look at the graph. Oh, sorry, here we go. So let's take a look at the graph. What did just happen here? What do you see? Well, I would say not a normal rational function, obviously. But I really want to know what is happening exactly at x equals 1, which promised to be the x-intercept and the vertical asymptote. So for this, what I do is I'm going to approach my the mouse or my pen in this case at x equals 1. Just be patient with me because this one takes a little bit of time to listen to me. Okay, here we go. I, I caught the point. And I am going to try to stop exactly at x equals 1. Oops, what do you see on the graph? The graph still says that at x equals 1, the function is undefined. And you see that the graph has a break in there. We call these kind of breaks a hole. Okay? And the graph of this function will actually be just this horizontal line, right? But with a break at exactly x equals 1. And the y-intercept will be right here at 3. 0, 3. Okay? So, how can we explain this? I'm going to draw the graph first. And then we'll have the perfect explanation for it. <laughs> here is Cartesian plane. I always like to be polite to the x and y axis, so I label them, give them a name. Don't call, call them hey, call them x and y. <laughs> and here is 1, 2, and 3. And it seems that the graph of the function will be a straight horizontal line. And continues both ends and here we go Oops. I am going to make this look more accurate so at x equals 1 we said that the graph will have a hole and I will indicate this hole by drawing one <laughs> so here is a hole and this is what the graph is going to look like now, why did this happen? Now, the equation of this function will help us explain it. When you look at y equals 3x minus 3 over x minus 1, you probably notice that 3 is a common factor. So let's factor this out. And then we obtain 3x minus 1 divided by x minus 1. So now we're thinking, hmm, that's great. I see that numerator and denominator have a common factor. Let's simplify. So the equation of this function in simplified form becomes y equals 3. And there goes the graph of y equals 3. Now, what happened when we removed the asymptote? Did the restriction remove? The restriction is still there, and that's why we have a hole. But the fact that we used to have an asymptote that now that came from the restriction, x different than 1, right? So... Since this asymptote is non-existent anymore because we simplified it, or we're going to use a different word here, we removed it, and we say that the hole is on the graph or will appear on the graph of this function. And that is due to the previous presence of the asymptote, which we are going to call by a special name. We're going to call x equals 1. A removable asymptote. 
So a hole on the graph of a rational function will appear when the graph has a removable vertical asymptote. And this is all about uh, rational functions of uh, the form linear over linear. I hope this lesson made sense. If you have any questions, please leave a comment. And um, 